Uh, Jacob, um, after all we have heard, is there anything you consider still impossible or is everything possible with mass surveillance? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, there are lots of things that are not possible with mass surveillance. For example, justice for individuals. That's not possible with mass surveillance. But after all we've heard where um, the NSA or other secret uh, services are looking at, is there still any blind spot that they don't look at at that, at that time? I think that there, there are. I think it, it has to do with economic scale. So if you, for example, were to hand me a USB disk right now, or if I were to reach into my pocket and I were to, let's see, there's a USB disk and I were to hand this to you, The NSA doesn't have coverage on what's on that disk. Okay, that, that would be safe. Maybe, I mean, yeah. except for the fact that you're filming it. Yeah. But the point is that there are plenty of things you probably don't want once on this disk. But, uh, I mean, there are plenty of things where they don't have coverage, or what they have is encrypted. And you see when they intercepted, for example, the European Parliament's fax machine, that they did it with a tempest attack, from what it appears, which implies that they couldn't break the crypto on the fax machine. They had to come and look at the electromagnetic radiation from the device. So what that tells us is something Edward Snowden has also said, which is that encryption works. So with strong encryption, we see that they may be able to see that someone is saying something. With an anonymity network like Tor, we may see that it's somebody, but we don't know who, is saying something. And combining these things together, it may raise your profile in terms of the traffic being worth watching. I'm not sure. But what we definitely know is that it is not as bad as them knowing exactly who you are and exactly what you have said, especially if you're going to say it anyway. Looking at where we are standing now and looking to the future, will it be possible to have a rollback to, to, to push back the secret services? Well, that's up to us, if it's still up to us. And how do we do it? First of all, defund them, right? This is a question of economics. The governments of the world ha are spending literally tens of billions of dollars per government in order to do this type of activity, right? It's been called the Manhattan Project of our era, for example, these kinds of surveillance and targeted exploitation systems. And if that's really the case, we should take a lesson from the last time we had a Manhattan Project. We created atomic weapons and it really put the world into quite a place. Maybe we don't want to repeat that again. So maybe we can learn from that and maybe we won't go down that path. Or maybe we're already down that path, but unlike atomic weapons, We have mathematics equally accessible to all. And maybe we can fund research in Europe and everywhere else in the world to actually work on decentralized, distributed, free software solutions that use strong cryptography because the centralized systems are compromised. In the European Parliament uh, right now, there's a, an inquiry starting. Uh, what are your hopes, your expectations of that inquiry? My hopes are that there will be an establishment of the ground facts, the ground truth. And my hope is that it will also include specific countermeasures. So, for example, a requirement that if you wish to have confidential, uh, confiden confidentiality on the telephone and you're a lawyer, that you would be negligent if you don't use an encrypted phone. If you're a doctor, the same. If, for example, you are a journalistic organization and you don't use something like Global Leaks, or have the equivalent uh, secure anonymous Dropbox as Desite Online or WikiLeaks, then you don't actually have the protection you think that you do, and thus you are also negligent. I also think that we need strong policy, but it is clear that policy alone does not provide privacy. We need privacy by design, and we need policy to strengthen it and to back it up, because fundamentally the ideals of liberal democracy do not hold up under mass surveillance, and we need technology to counteract the other technology But we will not change the world with technology alone. We need fundamental individual rights to be upheld for that technology to be useful and for it to exist in a way that it can be not just oppressive. Do you think, uh, for example, the NSA looking at uh, the European Union doing some kind of inquiry, will they laugh about it? Um, I'm sure that they laugh about a lot of things, mostly because they don't just hear the inquiry they hear what everybody says when they leave the room too, and probably in every room in this building. I mean, obviously that's mostly a joke, but I wonder how true it is. Why aren't there teams right now that are sweeping these buildings? Why aren't these teams finding the same vulnerabilities for Tempest attacks and fixing them? We need proactive, positive security improvements. And this 
is not something that is somehow counter to having reasonable accountability. It's not counter to fighting against terrorism. It is counter to the kind of terrorism that the surveillance states actually creates in every person's life, which is not proportional, is not balanced, and is usually completely illegal. What advice would you give to citizens? What, what can we do? Well, there are a couple of things, but one of them is to think about the risk and the choice. For example, there is the inherently selfish argument that I have nothing to hide. Well, it is true that I may not be ill. It may be true that I uh, am not blind. I still want to live in a world that has hospitals. I still want to live on a street which has accessibility for blind people. And it is also the case that I want to have a world where everyone has privacy and thus dignity, confidentiality, and integrity in their daily lives without having to ask for it, to beg it from a master. Because it is the case that when you ask someone for those things, they may not grant them. And then you will know you are not free. So what can people do? First, they can declare themselves to be free. And secondly, they can declare it by using strong encryption when they use telephones, by talking to journalists about the things that they experience, by actually taking steps to defund organizations that fundamentally violate the Grundgesetz, that reinterpret the G10 privacy laws that are criminal in nature, and that contribute to further criminal actions, such as the targeting of civilians with drones, which is what has happened with this surveillance data. And if that is true, there should be people who are prosecuted for it. Governments should fall over those types of actions. And it is each and every one of us that gets to make that choice every day. You moved to Berlin because you don't want to, for, for the time now, you don't want to live in the US. Uh, maybe you could describe your, let's say, experience with, uh, with your government. Well, I mean, my experience with my government is complicated and long. But the long and the short of it is that I have never been arrested in anything remotely related to these things as an adult. I'm a free person. And yet I have been treated as if I am a spy for my investigative journalism work with WikiLeaks and with other publications, including Der Spiegel, I might add. And this is horrible because what they do to people ranges from detainment at airports to seizures to when I'm For example, speaking at a conference, FBI agents approaching me, wanting to question me about supposed civil rights violations, which of course when other people are around, this has a chilling effect. And so my experience generally is that I have been targeted under anti-terrorism or uh, espionage related laws merely because of my political opinion and because of the effectiveness of my truth telling and my effectiveness of actually working to expose crimes that have been committed in my name with my tax dollars. And so I have moved to Berlin, and the reason is because in Berlin, I find that there is a historical appreciation of the 20th century that is missing from my country right now. That because of September 11th, but also because of the emergent phenomenon of patriotism in the form of anti-terrorism, in the form of extreme xenophobia, Islamophobia, and warmongering, It is much better to be in a place which is familiar with the end result of that kind of political thinking and is fundamentally working amongst the whole world, actually, to try to improve those things. And that's not to, you know, to say that Germany is perfect. And it's not to say that there aren't improvements to be made. It is merely to say that at least when those choices are made in the wrong direction, they are made with knowledge. And those, those decisions, they are made in both directions everywhere. But in the United States, it seems to be the case that Americans are not as outraged about political assassinations that only a few years ago were illegal, even in our country. This is something which would never stand in Germany and does not stand in Germany, in fact. And the same is true for the spying. The same is true for the extra legal harassment. Although Germany does have a problem with that, it's at a different scale. So for me, I mean, I am much happier in some ways to be living in Berlin But I'm also quite sad that I feel that I need to live somewhere else to continue my work, to be able to talk about what's going on, to not be targeted by the effective political secret police of the United States without ever being arrested, without ever being formally charged. And the things that have happened to my family members and the things that have happened to me personally are beyond the pale in their illegality, but also in terms of their psychological impact. And in Germany, there's a word for it, Zersetzung. 
And this is something that no one should need to live through. And that is exactly the reason that I have stopped subjecting myself to it. But I don't really consider it much of a choice. I consider it more of a moral duty to continue to work on these things. And I know that Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras and other people, they have the same. And they've made similar choices. It should not be this way. We should not have to make these kinds of choices. But while we are making these choices, I hope that we are creating more of a debate, more of a discussion, but that we're also making more of the historical stories, more of the uh, important outcomes of that historical context accessible to people. And I'm hopeful that by living in Berlin, at least for a while, my German will improve too.